Good morning, good evening, namaste, hola, bonjour, g'day mate and marapan. This is Namir Joshi, your host for the day. Welcome to episode 49 of the podcast, Each One, Teach Ten, An Amazing World of STEM. An inspiring venture where we'll be discussing that STEM is part of every day for every kid. We all will learn together how to build a STEM culture. Today, I'm glad to have Ms. Nikki Jones, who is an instructional technology coach in Northern Virginia, United States, just outside of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. She has a master's degree in education and 15 years of experience using technology to challenge students to think critically, problem solve, and be creative. In an effort to educate future ready students, Nikki focuses on creativity, STEAM, and computer science. She is a quizzes game changer, class dojo mentor, flip student ambassador, a smart ambassador, noble effective uh, ambassador, Ozobot certified educator, Adobe level two creative educator, Microsoft innovative educator expert, and HP fellow in cohort four. Wow, and for me, she is super energetic and inspiring. So how are you doing today, Miss Nikki? I'm so excited. I just have to start by thanking you. I think you are absolutely amazing and such an inspiration to the whole education community, but especially our young people and showing that age doesn't matter and you can really change the world at any age. So I'm just super excited to be here. I know it took us some time with time zones and days to get us scheduled, but we got it all worked out and here we are. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm I'm so happy that the time zones worked out and I finally get to record with you. And it's an honor for me. Right, so our audience is eagerly waiting to know more about you. So can we uh, can you let us know about how you're doing right now and what are some of the upcoming projects for you? So right now, I am just loving my position as an instructional technology coach. I get to work with students in K through five, and I get to work a lot with teachers on PD and just helping them to build more confidence to use technology in their classroom, to have that seamless technology integration, even when I'm not around. So a couple of the things that I've been loving and working on, um, I use Adobe Express a ton, and I've really been working a lot on having students to create portfolios. So this is, um, you're so familiar, you just did an amazing collection and shared that out with your big STEM challenge. So I'm really trying to get portfolios into our classrooms and having students share their creative work that they do throughout the year or throughout a unit in one place where they have the chance to really see their growth over time. And um, one of the big projects in fourth grade Virginia, we study Virginia history and they have to know so many dates and so many historic figures. So their teacher, huge shout out to Mrs. Caven, she said, hey, we need to do a timeline, but I don't wanna just do it in their notebook. So it was her idea and we've started an Adobe portfolio and they started with dates and we're plugging in Canva templates and videos and it's just gonna be a really awesome project. That sounds really amazing that how you've been building confidence for teachers using technology so that there's no uh, grudge against like using technology inside them and they're using that unconfidently in the classroom for the benefit of students and i really love the idea of using adobe express portfolios wherein students can share their own work and that is the best way to empower their voices while using adobe express so i really like that Yes, I love everything that you said about building teacher confidence. I think that's one of the big reasons why we get a little bit scared as educators to step in and do something, be a risk taker. But when you know you have somebody that's an expert in the technology and they can really take on that expertship in the content area, it just gives them a little bit of a boost. And my job is to kind of work myself out of a job, right? So I want mm -hmm. them to be so confident that they're using technology seamlessly even when I'm not there or they're just coming to me with an idea and working through it. So. Right. That's super exciting. 
Right, that's really empowering for teachers as well. Then they can also empower the rest of the teachers so that they can use technology with confidence. Yes. Right. All about so, that empowering word and also yeah. empowering their students, right? That's what you yeah. had mentioned. Yes. So when educators feel empowered to use their technology, they're in turn able to empower their students. So I think that's so important. Right. I agree with that. And um, I've been following you for a while. And I must say that you're such an incredible role model who inspires teachers, like you said, to help students develop the flexibility and technical proficiency they need to you know, work with emerging technologies because today's world is changing with so many things up, coming up and it takes time for people to adjust. So can you let us know more about that and how you've been able to cope up with it? I think that this is one of those questions in education where we always go back to relationships. So we know that students, we know that teachers, um, function best when they know that they're loved, they know that they matter, they know that they're important and cared about. So I think for me, the biggest thing is forming those relationships and letting teachers know that I get it. So I, I have been a classroom teacher. I formerly taught first grade and third grade. Um, so I know what it's like to be in the classroom. So I think those are two important things that the educators that I work with know. I, I was a teacher just like them and that I just want to help support them in any way that I can. Um, but it's all these little things that I feel like are kind of turning points. So teachers getting like a little shout out or I really like to do like on Microsoft Flip, I just make a quick shout out and notice something awesome that teachers are doing. And it seems like I'm not doing it for the, the benefit of it. But usually when I do it, the teachers turn around and they're like, okay, how can I use Nikki and remember like, oh, she's here to help me and support me. And the same thing happens when they see me kind of next door in another classroom. They're like, oh yeah, Nikki can help me do that. So it's taken a while to kind of build that culture and to get those relationships. But I think that's the number one and that's the key point for me getting into classrooms and really being able to make any kind of difference. And then just in that same respect is with the students. So I work in a school of K-5. We have over 750 students. And I try really hard to get to know all of them on a first name basis and really like what their interests are and things that excite them. So I think that also impacts my ability when I'm working with students and getting into the classrooms. I must say that's really encouraging that you're working on, you know, relationships that teachers, they matter, they have a value in your school, in the classroom. And then in this way, like uh, what I listened from you, I understood that we can have somebody to rely on and then being the one people can rely on. And that's how, you know, the process continues by learning from somebody and then being the one who is teaching others. Yes, absolutely. Right. So I, would, I want to ask you that how can a teacher ensure that the environment in the classroom is conducive to fostering a sense of empowerment among all students on a daily basis? I'm going to tell you, it goes back to that relationships again. I think that before you can teach kids anything, you have to have a solid relationship and they have to know that they matter and that you think that they're important and value them. So there are lots of different ways and that this looks in classrooms, but one of the biggest ways that I think that we can empower students is by giving them choice and voice. And there are a lot of apps and allowing that creativity, right? We don't want to give students just a worksheet and have everything fit into a box. So whenever I'm working with teachers, I'm really trying to integrate that creativity and critical thinking and show that, you know, creativity doesn't have to be something extra. It's not something that we just do in the art room or we do in the music room room that we can definitely do in the language arts room as well. And our product or whatever the students are making is not always going to look the same and there's going to be choice. So I really think relationships and choice are the biggest way to empower students. Right. I agree with that. And I really love how you're uh, connecting everything relationships because at the end of the day, we have to be kind, we have to be empathetic and we have to respect other people's opinions. 
And I really love the way you have uh, put that out with choice, voice, and agency, and how you've been able to, you know, create a positive classroom environment by building positive relationships and arranging the environment in such a way wherein, like, we can provide positive feedback to people and we can encourage collaboration. We can use certain methods of learning that students are very passionate about. And I like, you know, establishing a routine for them so that they can have this thing that, yes, we have to do certain things every day. And that makes them really balanced and engaged with people across the classroom. Absolutely. One thing that I kind of thought of as you were speaking to is I started this year using Jennifer Gonzalez's one point rubrics and really allowing, allowing students to have time to give peer feedback. And I think that has really made a big difference too in some of the classrooms that I'm visiting. They're able to, they're empowered, right, to do um, they're, they're trying to seek that four on a mastery based scale. And it's just so powerful for them to have feedback from their peers before they get it in an evaluative, evaluative, I'm not sure how to say that word, evaluative sense from, you know, the teacher, but they're mm -hmm. getting feedback from peers and really able to see where they're excelling because I think it's, it's a lot easier to hear that from a peer. And I, that's one thing that I've learned a lot through the Adobe community and, you know, those creativity institutes and things. So that's one thing that's been really powerful for me this year. Right, like feedback is what matters because it's not important that every time we're doing certain things correct, but if when we take feedback from our peers, we understand where we could improve ourselves because learning never stops. So the more we right. improve, the better it becomes, the outcome. Yes. Right. So my next question to you, Ms. Nikki, is how do you help your students make personal connections to what they are learning? I think this one is so important and with STEAM and STEM that we're presenting students with these real world problems we're we're facing right now. You know, we were just in a global pandemic or maybe we're still there in the middle of a global pandemic or the things that are happening to our world with the global warming and the ice caps and all these different things. So I think it's important that students really understand why they're learning the things that they're learning and then how to apply that and make that critical thinking part of their beyond school. So if more than anything, I think, you know, those critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, citizenship, it's so important that we teach that in a school setting with framed questions of the real world. So any chance that I get, I try to incorporate student names in things. It seems so minor and silly, but I think that goes back to those relationships. So if I'm posing a STEAM question or a math problem solving, um, I'm always just trying to make it as personal as I can. And that might be, you know, as silly as incorporating their name or incorporating some kind of theme that they like or a character or something. So I think also, you know, giving students that choice and knowing where their strengths are is also another way to connect really personally with them. That's really significant that you're talking about, you know, uh, to under make students understand like why they are learning a thing and then how they can apply that in real life. Because I have faced this thing in the classrooms, like when we are studying certain things of maths or geography or history, students are like, why are we studying this? Where do we need to apply that? But later they realize that like when we're doing certain competitions out of school, but that is learning that matters. Like that helps us a lot when we are, you know, going ahead for competitions or for problem solving. So they really understand at that time that everything we're learning in the school is really important because it can help us like anytime, especially when it comes to mathematics. Math is literally everywhere. It can be applied yes. into every field. And like if people think about like, why maths? It's not th there because it is incorporated in every single field in real life as well. So maths is really important. And that's how teachers are teaching us how to apply those learning in real life. Like you mentioned with, you know, personal connections or forces and, and every subject has a value in our life anywhere. Yes, I agree with that. And I love that you said, you know, math is everywhere. I think science is also everywhere too. And it's so right. important for our kids to see that. And there are some really awesome 
educators and people who inspire educators like you that are sharing things, that STEM challenge with all of the things about pollution and everything going on and how to get students to really be active and actively involved. Jennifer Williams, I know you've had her on your podcast. She's doing amazing things in this field. Um, Chris Woods, there's just so many people that you can connect with. And that I feel like for me, that's a powerful way for me to get ideas to inspire my students in the classroom and to continue to make those real world connections mm -hmm. is when I can find, you know, a young lady like yourself and say, hey, this this young girl came up with this and, and let's di di dig in, dive in and go deeper with it. And I think that's just a really cool thing for them to have that personal connection on that level that someone at their peer level is really presenting things to them and making them think differently and challenge them in a new way. So kudos to you. You were absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Miss Nikki. So I have this really fun question for you. If you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose and why? Oh my goodness. Coffee with any historic figure? I might have to go way back to George Washington. Oh, <laughs> I, nice. <laughs> he's the father of our country and he had so many amazing friends that he connected with and lived at Mount Vernon. So to go back and hang out at Mount Vernon, which is really close to where we are right now, where I live in Northern Virginia, um, and just to see life in a very different capacity, right? Way before technology was even thought of or in any capacity part of the education system. So I think it would just be really interesting to talk to someone so far removed from technology and what we're doing today. And I think it would be really funny to see their reaction because I can't imagine um, that many years ago they would expect, you know, people to be living off a cell phone and <laughs> just at the tip of your hands being able right. to call somebody or look up, you know, a date or a random fact. So I think it, that would be really interesting. That's great. Like if I talk about oh, myself, I just, uh, yeah, I was just thinking like, how about meeting Isaac Newton? Like, oh. cause I would like to ask him, what if the apple did not fall on your head? Then how would you realize that gravity even existed? That's what I would like right. to ask him. We'd be in a whole different evolve game, right? Right. And what if like somebody came and like just picked that apple up before it fell? What would have happened? Like, I don't know. I just always feel like if I met any of those scientists, I would like to ask them, like, how are they so intelligent? I just don't know. <laughs> I know, and I love that though, but so many of our scientists, I think, have more important lessons to teach us, not even that they're so intelligent, but that they persevered through failure, right? And right. that they have that grit. And yes. that's one of the things that I really want to instill in children. And it's one thing that is really hard for kids to learn is, you know, when something gets hard, not to give up or when they are faced with a challenge to continue persevering or when they fail to keep on going despite it being hard. So I love that you're thinking about their intelligence, but I think we can also think about it in that light of yes. what could they teach us in that capacity too. Yes, I agree. Totally agree with that. So my next question to you is what is the necessity and importance of self-learning? Ooh, self-learning. I think this one is really important because every person on the planet, not even just our students, learn in different ways. So I think as educators, it's really important that we find the best way that students learn. And that can be hard in a, in a environment with 25 children, 28 children in your class. But I think that differentiation is so important that we are really teaching students at their level. And I think a lot of this can be achieved with technology and giving students choice, giving them that agency in their learning. Um, a lot of things like Microsoft Flip are a great way. I can easily record a lesson at two or three different levels or have different tasks for students without anybody even knowing really that anything is different. Um, so I just think students really need, in order to make any kind of progress, they need to be taught at their level and they also need to be able to show their mastery of content at their level so that 
that's challenging as an educator. I know that's one of the hardest things in a classroom, but I think it's also one of the most important things. Right. I must say, like, you're really inspiring how you're talking about so many different things. And when it comes to self-learning, um, you're mentioning about how people learn in different ways and teachers providing them with different tasks so that they're taught at their level for progress. And, like, uh, that will help students, like, learn um, whatever they want, like, whenever they want and how they want it. And, like, in this way, teachers can drive the learning process as well. And, you know, the effect the learning becomes more effective and instructional because students are learning the way they want to and like even like when it comes to personal i, I really prefer self-learning as well because if i'm learning in the classroom and i come back home i can revisit the concept and then learn that thing on my own in my own way like if i prefer making for example i'm like let's say i prefer making mind maps and i like to make notes so that's perfectly my choice the way i want to learn and if teachers are incorporating the self-learning techniques in the classroom, it becomes more engaging because the students are learning the way they want to learn, not the way teachers want them to learn. So that phase, the classroom becomes more engaging and lively. I think the one thing that stuck out to me too that you said is not only is it more engaging, but the students really have ownership of their learning, right? You feel like that belongs to me and that's my responsibility. I like mind mapping and I like notes. This is how I'm really going to process the information and ensure that I've learned it. So I think that's so important that you mentioned that ownership piece and really knowing that students are taking part. They're not just a passive consumer. And I keep, you know, one of my big things is consumption over consuming or consuming over consumption. What do we really want our kids doing? Do I want you to sit in my class and take notes while I lecture for 45 minutes? Absolutely not. But if that's what's going to help you remember and learn it, I encourage you by all means to do that. But I think that's so important when they feel like they have ownership, but also that their ownership is valued, right? So I think right. that's another really important key. Yeah, I agree with that. So in the end, I would like to ask you, uh, where can we find you online? And we would also love to have a message from you for the audience. So I am really active on Twitter. My handle is at M-R-S-J-O-N-E-S. -E 72812. So I am active. I'm always posting ideas and looking for ideas. I follow a lot of the communities that I belong to. Um, and that's just a really great way for me to connect with other educators. And I love to be inspired by those communities. A lot of the great ideas that I get to bring back to my classrooms are from something that is sparked on Twitter. So I guess maybe following on that, that my one message would be to find educators who are your people, find people who are doing similar things as you and are like-minded. You know, my position, the, the way that it's structured, I'm the one and only in my building. So I work with about 60 or more teachers and I have 750 kids, but there's only one of me. So I think that it's really important for me to connect with other instructional technology coaches. So one way I do that is I have a weekly meeting with like five or six other coaches. We have this open chat going. And when I'm not doing that, I'm just constantly on Twitter connecting with people and getting ideas and support. And it helps me to not really feel like an island, although in this position as a one person at a building, it can be very secluding or very island-like. So I just think that it's so important to find people who are similar to you and connect with them and lean on for support and also to be that support and encouragement for them. Thank you so much, Ms. Nikki. Listening to you today like has you know, reminded me of this quote, uh, that says like there are two ways of spreading light to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it so thank you so much for being here it was such an honor to have you and listening to the way you've been talking about empowering people empowering the teachers and students being the one who is uh, you know people can rely upon and then how we can value relationships for me it has been really learning and i'm sure for the audience as well Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. You are just phenomenal. And I'm just so excited that you thought to have me on. Thank you so much, Miss Nikki. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and listening to this episode. 
and i'll see you in the next one till then each one teach 10 have a nice day